all hear me? We're good? Great. So thank you so much for coming. It's really great to see you. I would love to get a read uh, because I'm going to talk about myself a lot. So I'd like to talk about you for a minute. How many of you identify as designers? Nice. And uh, product owner type business type people? <coughs> Not as many. OK, good. So I'm talking about peeps. And uh, how about uh, space nuts? How many of you are space nuts? Rock on! I love to see that. That makes me so happy. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we've had. And really, while I'm going to be talking about design for a specific type of user at NASA, this can be applied to users who are salespeople, who are doctors, who are executives. There's a lot of types of users that have the same challenges that these guys have, believe it or not. So let's get started. Uh, as he said, I've been designing interfaces for 20 years. And he might have been very gently warning me that I could ruin my reputation in five minutes, so I'm going to try not to do that. But what I have to say is that designing for NASA has taught me that while I thought I knew some stuff, I actually know nothing. And it's really amazing. I have never had so much fun being the dumbest person in the room. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the DSN is. I'll talk about why you should care about it, who runs it, because they're my users, and I love them. And then I'm also going to talk about some of the techniques we've used. And I'll spend most of my time on that, because it sounds like a lot of you are technique -y type people, so that's great. Let's start with what the DSN is. The Deep Space Network is a system of antennas throughout the world in three sites. We have one in California really close to us. We have one in Australia and one in Madrid. And these antennas are how we talk to every spacecraft that's further away than the moon. That's a broad generalization, but it, it does the job. All of the stuff that is out there in deep space, if you want to get pictures back from it, if you enjoy seeing the stuff from Juno, which I'll show you in a minute, it comes through the deep space network. It's like our phone line, basically, to the spacecraft. There are 13 antennas right now. We're building two more. And three of them are 70 meters. That's these three left ones, 63, 14, and 43. And they are the only three 70 meters in the world. So those 70 meter antennas are the only antennas that can talk to Voyagers 1 and 2, who are that way and that way, out past the boundaries of our solar system. The Deep Space Network is manned 24 hours a day seven days a week, 365 days a year at all three sites. So there's always people watching the network, making sure that things are happening when they should and the way they should. And those are the people I'll be talking about. So some of the exciting challenges I've had are that the Deep Space Network has been around for about 60 years. It supported the Apollo program. We got the first pictures from the moon from the Deep Space Network. And so you have all this old technology that was original, and it was cutting edge 60 years ago. But it hasn't broken yet, because they built it really well, so we're still using it. And then you pair that with new technology, new interfaces, new stuff that's come along. Like even the power within, inside the antennas, it's been replaced by a box that was this big became a box that is this big, right? Like, things are getting upgraded as they break, as there's budget to upgrade them, and they have to live and play nicely with the old stuff that's still in there. Additionally, there isn't always budget to make changes. I'm not getting to push stuff out to the DSN every three weeks like I used to when I was working in Silicon Valley. I have to wait three, four years before my designs go live. And then that piece of software may not be touched again for 20 years. So I don't get to do any cutting edge design. I don't get to use anything that's a trend or fad. I have to stick with things that are going to last for 20 years. So why do you care about the Deep Space Network? Well, if you like that, you care. If you like that, you care. The Deep Space Network is how we get these pictures. I actually got to see the antenna that this picture came through. It was like living a little piece of history, I have to tell you. It was really amazing. But more amazing is who is the DSN. 
These are probably my favorite people in all of NASA. And NASA people are awesome, you guys. So the DSN people to be my favorite, that says something, right? These guys, whoa. What did I do? Did I touch something? I'm good now, okay. So <laughs> I don't know that I'm really good, actually. These guys are mostly male. 8% of them are female. There's uh, six women. Um, they are mostly older people. Like, the youngest is 35, I think, but most of them are, are in their 60s. They're highly technical. These guys can tell me exactly what carrier strength they expect on that spacecraft connected to that antenna at this time of year. They can tell me the symbol and bit rate that should be coming in. But they still have flip phones. They're not technology early adopters. Change, new stuff, it tends to be viewed with suspicion, and I'll explain why. Here they are in their natural habitat, the wild operator themselves. <laughs> Normally this room's way darker, but they had turned up the lights for us, so I took the opportunity to snap some pictures. Uh, you can see that they are all in this kind of, it should be way more high tech, right? But it's kind of this like computer circle that they live within. And they stare at these screens for eight to 12 hours every day. In the US, it's eight hour shifts. In Spain and Australia, it's 12 hour shifts. And interestingly, in Spain and Australia, by the way, they do two days on, two nights on, four days off. Lather, rinse, repeat for five weeks, and then they get two weeks of vacation. It sounds like a dream, let me tell you. Um, so they're staring at these consoles for all that time in a darkened room. And their job is to, when it's time on the schedule, point the antenna at the spacecraft, and we have predictions about where the spacecraft's going to be, but it's not necessarily 100% accurate. So they have to do this thing called a con scan, where they send the antenna in a little spiral till they get locked with the spacecraft. So then it's their job to calibrate everything, make sure it's connected, make sure you're transmitting on the right band, capture a downlink from this spacecraft, start getting data, and also possibly send an uplink with commands. After that, that's the first half hour of a track. Then they just sit there and stare at that. On a normal, like, regular track, some of these spacecraft that you've probably heard of, like Cassini and Juno, um, it can be about an hour that they just sit there and stare and wait for something to go wrong and then fix it. On Voyager, it's eight hours because it takes so long to get the data. She's so far away that the round trip light time is just insane. So we pointed at her and just sit and wait. And they often go off and help other operators because nothing's going to go wrong on Voyager. She's been doing her thing since 1977. The big deal is that you see all this color here and all this cognitive noise. All those screens are designed 20 years ago. They look very 90s and they have very 90s sensibilities. And nobody, when they designed them, was thinking about situation awareness. How do I see when something goes wrong? How do I eliminate all the noise so that if there's a problem, it comes right up front immediately? Now we're thinking about that. One important thing, <clears throat> if you're thinking about situation awareness, this can be referred to as a vigilance task. It can be long, it can be boring. It can be uninteresting. Sometimes operators fall asleep. That's very rare, but it does happen, right? You're working an overnight shift. Your body isn't used to working nights, and nothing's going on with Voyager, so you lean back to get comfortable, and, you know, 10 minutes later, you wake up. So we have to think about how to design for a vigilance task. How do we keep them alert? How do we keep them interested? How do we let them know at an instant glance that everything is okay just in case they do nod off? And then the other thing that you need to know about the operators is that this is their old interface. Here's Matt. He's showing me that they used to go and inside the antennas and tweak that knob and listen for the woo to get to the right tone. And that's how they knew the spacecraft was in lock. 
So this is what they used to do just like 15 years ago. Because Matt's only been here 15 years. By the way, he's the second most junior operator. 15 years, second most junior. So they used to go out into these beautiful buildings underneath the dishes that they call an alidade. And they used to start flipping switches and turning knobs and plugging stuff in and hot swapping things. To them, that was real operations. And now we've given them those screens. I actually heard one operator say, I used to be an antenna operator and now I'm a computer operator. There's a lot of nostalgia for these good old days when they didn't have as much power, they didn't have as much insight, they didn't have as much control, but they had this tangible thing. They had a relationship with their equipment. So this type of thing makes this a change resistant user. And when I say that, that sounds like it might be a derogatory thing, but let me just tell you, every single one of us is a change resistant user. When mobile phones came out and we all had the hardware keyboards and we were like using our Palm Pilots or our, our like, God, what was that one? The G1, the very first Android phone had that great keyboard. We loved it. And then the touch screen came out and people were like, why do I need that? I have my keyboard. But how many of you still have a hardware keyboard today, right? We all have touch screens. We resisted the change, but it came and it was better. It improved our lives. So all of us are change resistant because every time you change something that you're used to, it introduces risk and delay and inefficiency. You got to learn the new thing. You have to take time. You have to slow down through the muscle memory processes that you used to have. And these are people for whom risk could mean dead people. Like if that antenna radiates into a person, a person dies. If the antenna turns the wrong direction and crushes a car, the person in the car dies. That's the worst case scenario, but to them almost as bad as we might lose data, right? You might be connecting to curiosity to send her the next commands for her to drive from here to here, and yes, that's about how much she moves in a day. And then you lose your connection because you're not familiar with the screens that you're looking at. You're not sure where to click or what to do and you made a mistake or you just couldn't get there in time. And all of a sudden, Curiosity's project team has lost an entire day. And that sets everything back, right? So to these guys, losing data is almost as bad as losing life. They take such pride in their job. Another fun thing to note is that there are three different cultures in the three different sites. But even more than that, there's a different culture on every shift within each site. So while I'm trying to understand how operations are done, I have this great challenge of also understanding the different ways it's viewed in about 100 different ways, right? This is typical. If you, go, if you design things for salespeople or doctors or executives, you will find that exact same thing. You'll find not only are there regional cultural differences, but there are cliquish cultural differences. And that's an important thing to keep in mind as you design. So I just told you how much these guys hate change. Guess what? It's coming. NASA's got a new program. Uh, right now, the DSN sites are at like 120 points around the globe, right? 120 degrees, three points around the globe. We're going to change it so that operations is happening at the site that has daylight. So that from like nine to five, the operators are working a normal shift and they are controlling their site plus the other two sites. This makes perfect sense from a single point of failure standpoint, right? We are minimizing risk because right now, if one of the sites were to go down, we would lose all of the data and all control of those antennas because nobody else can control those sites. But once follow the sun happens, we'll be able to control all three sites from any of the sites, as well as from our network operations center at JPL. Additionally, it'll let the operators work a normal shift. They won't have to deal with midnight shifts, overnight shifts, 
anything like that. They'll be able to let their bodies adjust to daytime and have better lives. But it's scary, right? It's different. It's risk. On top of that risk, we are increasing their workload. So right now, one operator, one antenna, one spacecraft. That's a link, okay? It's hard. It's really hard. One operator, two antenna, two spacecraft. They do that sometimes, and it's much harder. It's not an incremental increase. It's kind of an order of magnitude increase in cognitive burden. We're taking them to one operator having three antennas with three spacecraft. And I'll tell you right now, there's a thing called MSPA, where one antenna can point at more than one bird at the same time. For example, we have eight birds around Mars. So theoretically, you could point an antenna at Mars and receive downlink from all eight. Can you imagine having three links, each with eight birds? That's 24 spacecraft that you are watching and monitoring. And that's the wild, wild west, man. That is crazy intense. You're splitting your attention between three different things. And research shows humans can't multitask. Even brilliant humans like these guys, you just can't do it. So how am I going to make that possible? Because I got to tell you, that's my job. I... I and my team, and I, get as, I have to tell you that uh, I've been with the Deep Space Network for two years now. And before that, there were people working on this project for about two years. So we have about four years of history researching this, understanding the problem, and figuring out how we can make these guys better, lessen the impact of the change, make their job possible to do when you triple their workload and like quadruple their cognitive burden. So we tried some things. <clears throat> Not all of them worked. It's important to know what doesn't work. That's part of UX, right? So first of all, big changes with no user research. Not going to work. Uh, we had a great, very well-meaning, incredibly capable team of developers before the UX group joined the project. And these guys built some really smart software, powerful as all get out. Like, this stuff was amazing. but. They didn't know how to do user research. They wanted to. They talked to people. They asked people what they wanted. Anybody who's a user research in here knows that asking people what they wanted is not a great idea. Henry Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Favorite quote. So they put this software out there, and five years later, one operator uses it. One. Once a month for one specific task. Nobody else will touch it. It's not that it's bad software. It's just not user-friendly. There's a lot of great features in there. It just wasn't designed around the human and around the human's needs. So another thing that doesn't work, drastic changes without good reason. We came in and we looked at that 90s interface and we went, <laughs> we're designers. We can do better than this. We can give you minority report. And we designed some gorgeous stuff, you guys. Like, stuff I would be proud to put in my portfolio if only I could. We showed it to them, and they threw up all over it. No way! This sucks! God, why would you do that to us? And we were like, but it's so beautiful. And their answer was, but I don't need it. I get more information from my ugly screens, and I'm used to them. I don't need your pretty screens. Okay, so we'll think about that one. Another thing you can't do is changes that have good reason, but they're too drastic. Change-resistant users don't like change. If you have a good reason and you want to make a drastic change, you're going to have to go step by step to get there. You can't go point A, point B with a teleporter. You have to go point A, point B by foot, one little step at a time. So one of the changes that we tried was operators send commands to the antenna to do things. Change the bit rate to this. Um, move one degree to continue tracking the spacecraft. Um, uh, change your symbols. We thought, what a great idea. We'll give them autocomplete on their commands. That way, when new operators are coming on board, they don't have to learn every command. They kind of have like a man built in, right? 
They're typing out. It saves them time. They can just hit enter. We'll get this right out there, and they're going to love it. And they took one look at it and said, oh, I can't trust this. It was too drastic of an interface change. These are people who use flip phones. For them, autocomplete wasn't a natural assumption like it is for people like us who are using Google all the time and watching it autocomplete for us and thanking it for suggesting that. For them, it was suspicious. It was uncomfortable. So we're working toward that. We now have a command lookup, and the command lookup is the first step toward autocomplete, and you can turn it on or off. Many of them have it off, but they know it's there, and they'll turn it on to use it, and then they'll turn it off again. That's step one. We'll get there. We'll get there eventually. And then I'm just going to say that user acceptance testing is abuse. Don't do it. <laughs> this is a waterfall term. It makes sense when you're shipping flight software, right? This thing was written for five years. There's only one person who's ever going to use it. And uh, it has to be QA'd for a year before it goes onto the spacecraft. User acceptance testing is fine then. But if you are doing software that has more than one user, and most of you are, user acceptance testing is a form of abuse because you build the thing, you're done with it, you're ready to ship it, and then you show it to them? What? How can you get it right? Um, you're going to have to show it to them early and often. And that's why that's the first thing on my what does work. When I get an idea, I make a sketch of it on my iPad. I export it to PDF, and I email it to an operator. First thing I do, first idea. I don't even talk to the product people about it. I don't even get permission to build this yet. I ask the operators, does this have merit? Does it solve your problem? Does it make sense? How can it be improved? Should I explore this? Sometimes they say no, and I know better than them, so I make another iteration and send it again. Sometimes they say no, and I get what they're coming to, and I abandon it. But I involve them from the first inkling of thought, and then I involve them at every step. So we all iterate. I show them every iteration, even the bad ones. And trust me, according to them, most of my iterations are bad. <laughs> it's very humbling. But that builds trust, right? They know that I'm going to listen to them. I once had an operator say to me, you know, before you came along, people would come talk to us every couple years, and we never really saw any results. But you come every month, and I feel like you're really listening, because every time you come, I see stuff from the last time you were here. And that was a huge compliment, because it meant I was teaching them that they could trust me. And this is the kind of relationship you should build with your users, especially change-resistant users, because you have to know their problems intimately, and you have to let them know that you're going to hold their hand through solving those problems. You're not just going to hit them with these really complex interfaces up front. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the detailed techniques. You're all designers. You all observe. You don't need me to go into detail on this one, but it's the duh technique. Right? You do user interviews, you do observations. The two are different. User interviews, you're talking to them. You're right there. You're changing the result by being in the room with it. Observations, we have these great fishbowls in all three complexes because they lead public tours through. So the observations are great because we can step outside and not be interfering. We also do experiential research. This is my intern, Stephanie. She's connecting to Voyager. I've connected to Voyager and Voyager 2, which is pretty exciting because you can only connect to Voyager 2 from the Southern Hemisphere. So we all sit down with the operators. And there's an operator hovering right behind Stephanie, right? And he's telling her what to do. Click this, do that, get your acquisition. Um, but having that experience of doing the job even though I'm an idiot and I can't do half what these guys do, right? I can't even pretend that I have their expertise. I've sat in their chair. I've eaten their dog food. You should eat your dog food too. 
if you have customer service people that you're designing for, go do customer service with them for a while. If you're designing for salespeople, go out in the field with them for a couple days. Do their job with them, and that experience is going to be incredibly educational. We also paper prototype like you wouldn't believe. I start super low fidelity, and you can see the operators start drawing stuff immediately. Oh, man, you know what would be great is if when I put my mouse over this, this thing shows up. Yes, give that, give that, give that. The paper prototyping is so powerful because especially when you're low fidelity like this, it doesn't look baked. It looks like something they can have influence over. And you want them to influence it because you're designing for your users, not for yourself. And then I keep the paper, paper prototyping going all the way through. So this actually came out of, we did a journey map, we did user interviews to follow up on the opportunities we found in the journey map, and then we came up with a concept of a combined sequence of events. You're managing a bunch of things, let's put all those things together ordered by time, so you can just look at what do I have to do next. I showed them this paper prototype, they walked through using it, and then one operator got up and hugged me. I think that means I did it right. We've also done a ton of participatory design. So the guy in the plaid shirt, that's John Mason. He is a third generation DSNer. His grandfather was a mechanic on the DSN. His father was an engineer and he was an operator. Now he's ops chief. He's at the darkroom in JPL and he observes and monitors and controls the entire network. If something goes wrong, he's the guy to fix it. He's the one putting out new sequences of events, putting out new predicts. He's, he's the chief, right? Robin on the right is the newest operator out at Goldstone. At that time, she'd been there about a year. Now she's been here about two years. She comes out of an aerospace education background, but she picked up the job much faster than most people do. Let me repeat that. She's been here a year and she's still picking up the job. It's that hard to learn. So we brought out a novice user and an extremely expert user. And we asked them, what are the things that could make your job better? How can we make your life easier? What are the gaps in your experience today? And oh man, the post-it notes were flying. This brainstorming session had like piles up on the table. It was pretty, pretty awesome. And then after that, we did an affinity map. I'm assuming you all know what affinity maps are, but I'll give you just a very quick, like two second. You take all the things, you categorize them into categories that seem natural. They think they move in and out of categories and eventually you settle on some clumps that are logical. Then we picked a clump and we said, you know what, let's design this. And my fellow designers and I sat while these guys got up and drew on the whiteboard. Now the display that we designed after this doesn't look like that. Things aren't in exactly those places, but it helped us know what the need was, how they thought about it, and what the information hierarchy should be. And those are invaluable because only the user knows. You can never know that without talking to the user. So paper dolls is a little bit novel. This was an activity that we did because we wanted to test what it was like to manage three links at once. But you can't do that with live links because you're risking data. That's dangerous. So we took them to an empty workstation. We printed out every display they have in triplicate and said, here you go. Tape things up as you would open displays. And you see the result is a little chaotic. Can you imagine trying to manage all this complicated equipment with that? So this actually did a few things for us. First, it really proved that this needed to be done, that there was a really good reason for us to be doing this project. And the executives and management who look at that, we even shared this with NASA headquarters. They were like, oh my God, there's a problem here. Why, yes, there is. It also helped us understand that one of the big issues we had, which we hadn't thought of, was screen real estate. So we needed to find ways to put more information in more compact form. And then another thing that it did is it helped us identify where the risks are in the, um, 
in the three link management process, right? We found out that, oh, this scenario would actually be a nightmare. You better design something to take care of that. Those were really important things. And I want to explain the name. I had called this paper prototyping. And uh, I came over to one of our senior operators, who was the tech lead that day, and said, uh, you know, I need to borrow Adrian because it's time for him to do the, the, the exercise. And Jonathan puts his hands on his hips. He's a Marine. He puts on his hands on his hips like this, and he looks at me very sternly, and he says, do you think that your paper dolls are more important than what Adrian's doing right now? And I looked up at him, and I said, Yes. <laughs> and he said, okay, cool. <laughs> but ever since then, it's been called Paper Dolls. Another sort of novel thing that we've done is we wanted to update their UI so that it could be more readable. We found that their UI actually was really difficult because the fonts were hard to read, the colors weren't necessarily um, helping things, and uh, the organization was really haphazard. It was not scannable at all. So we took both their existing displays without making any changes and revised versions of their visual language. We didn't change any fields. We didn't change the layout. We just gave it a different skin. And we tested how long does it take before somebody finds the thing that changed. Because that's what they're doing, right? They're looking for something to go wrong. They're waiting for something to change. And we found that in their existing user interface, it took them 19 seconds to find the thing that changed. That's not bad. That's actually pretty good. 19 seconds to catastrophe, no problem. They also made some errors. In the new interface that we did, it took them 12 seconds. So we had a 50% improvement on time to find the problem with just a skin change. And it was a minor skin change. You see, this isn't that different than what they've got. The one they have is on the left there in the three. The one that we did is on the, in the middle and on the right. We didn't really change it that drastically. We just did some tweaks for readability and scannability, and it improved it that much. The heat maps, by the way, show that they didn't make any errors at all. Both of those places are things that changed. And then we also cultivate ambassadors like you wouldn't believe. Um, this is an incredibly great secret weapon for you guys. Find the users who are the most vocal, especially if they hate you. That's the best. Because then you make friends with them. Hey, you said you hated this thing. I love you. Could you tell me more about that? I want to hear it. You create a relationship. I ask these guys about their kids. They send me pictures of their birds and their farms and all kinds of crazy stuff. I send them pictures of my car when I do something new to it and they think it's great. We've built a friendship and these ambassadors are the people that when I have a quick idea, I can email it to them. Or when I have a question, hey, what the hell does BWP mean on this screen? They will get back to me within like an hour. These guys are amazing because I have built that kind of privileged access, mutual bond between us. And what they get out of it, besides the fact that they know I'm listening for sure, is also that they get to see stuff first. They get that kind of ego boost of, I know something you don't know. And let me tell you, these guys love that. Also, banana bread. <laughs> Bribery is a valid technique. I use this with my daughter, I use it with my operators, I use it anytime I can. Bribery is your best friend. People are busy. They don't want to devote time to talking to you about your paper dolls, right? They want to do their thing. They're not getting incented. Even the people that you're bringing in from outside that you're giving $100 to, the $100 incentive is not enough. The bribery makes them understand that, first of all, you put some effort into this, because I bake the banana bread every time. I make it by hand. So they know I was thinking about them, and I put effort into them. Additionally, when I walk in the room, they get this Pavlovian response of like, what'd you bring us this time? You know, it's, it's great. You, <laughs> you gotta love when people drool, right? And then, 
At the end of the year, we report up to NASA headquarters what we've done for the whole year. And I have this slide in which I have a bar chart of banana breads showing my visits out to the complexes. And that's how NASA knows I'm engaging the user. And you know what? That slide is the most popular slide in my entire chart. So I'm down to only 10 minutes, but that's good because I'm down to only one slide. I want to talk about what we're planning for the future. We want to see how far we can take these guys. How far can we evolve their interfaces? My dream is for the operators to be running the deep space network from at home on their couch in their jammies. And when they're ready, they go like this to move the antenna. How cool would that be? They're not there yet. They're not going to be there for 20 to 30 years, but I'll get them there, right? There will be all these amazing technologies that we can infuse into the deep space network to make operations more precise, more fun, more engaging for the people who are doing it. And guess what? That means more data for you guys when you're looking at the beautiful pictures. We're also exploring automation, and we have to be very careful with this because everybody knows automation makes people stupid, right? When you automate things, you multiply the efforts of the human, but you also decrease their knowledge of what's going on. You decrease their abilities to do it manually. How many times have you tried to drive around your own city without GPS and then given up and opened up to ways, right? This happens. Automation makes us stupid. So we're exploring how far can we go with automation without breaking the brains of the people who are using it. And then PR and goodwill and training all go hand in hand. First of all, we're changing how things are communicated to the operators because we're giving them inside information every time we talk to them. So nothing's a surprise anymore. Change resistant users hate surprise, right? Who wants to be told at the very last minute that your iPhone's about to be bricked and you have to go buy a new one? Nobody. So we're giving them all this advance warning of what's coming at them and we're letting them make those changes on their own terms, as well as we're changing how new operators are trained. We're making things easier for them to learn, but we're also changing the training process so it may not take a full year anymore. With all that, thank you for letting me talk about my favorite subject, and I have a little bit of time for questions. I'm looking for hands. I see one right there. Do the user pages correct the rotation of the Earth as they're tracking the satellites or birds? Yes, absolutely. So you're on a planet that is moving through space, right? We're rotating the sun. Also, the planet itself is turning. And a lot of the times, the, we have these things called predicts that is basically a location file that tells us where in space we expect the spacecraft to be. And the operators are doing, they used to do this math in their heads, but now they have these wonderful configuration tables that do the math for them. They're doing this incredible math for what angle, as the, as the antenna rotates away from the spacecraft, what angle should the antenna point at to continue pointing at the spacecraft? It's really amazing. Yes? What kind of balance do you have to play um, kind of catering to an older mindset as your technology and your people and uh, operators are coming in? Is it frustrating to see that changing, or is it kind of an inevitability in terms of complexity of the world? Sure. Uh, the question was, how am I balancing designing for an older mindset and new capabilities? Uh, and is it frustrating? And I'll tell you, no, it's not frustrating. Uh, in part because one of my previous jobs, I was designing interfaces for senior citizens. So I'm very used to this concept of people who are supposedly technology resistant, and really they're not. What happens is, these are your best usability testers because they have a very hardware model of the world in their head. We all think of the world in terms of software. I wish I could delete things when I'm writing by hand, right? Because I'm so used to a keyboard. But these are people who are not. So if you start to understand that their cognitive model is just different and that they need maybe skeuomorphism, maybe analogies, or maybe they just need things to blink at them and tell them what to do next, then you make a really usable system that even younger people can use. And it's pretty amazing. 
right here in the front. So the question was, what is the take on hidden figures, and what's it like being there as a woman? Um, I can't speak for NASA, but I can speak for me and many of my colleagues. Uh, JPL is about 40% female, and NASA has always been really good at employing women throughout its history, which is super awesome. They haven't always been good about treating women well, but they do now. I will say that firsthand, they do a great job. Uh, Hidden Figures was amazing. If you haven't seen it, please do. It's a very important movie. Women are the reason that you have astronomy today. Women were the first computers who figured out redshift, right? There is no astronomy without women. So it's really exciting to see how well NASA treats and appreciates its women. Um, and we did a great photo opportunity on Women's Day, where we got all of the women into mission control at JPL. And it's funny because we didn't fit. <laughs> it's a huge building. It's like all three of these conference rooms combined, and all the women couldn't fit. It was awesome. Back there. So I want to tell you that the question was, why is NASA tripling the operator's workload? And that's a really touchy question, right? Because who wants their workload tripled? But I'll tell you that it's so that we can save jobs. Um, we don't want to lay anybody off. We want to keep as many people as we can. But remember, it takes a year to learn this job. So we can't just hire people off the street to help these guys. When we go to 24, or the follow the sun process, away from 24 by seven operations, there's more antennas for the same number of people. So we have to triple their workload. It's not that we wanna make life harder on them, it's that if we wanna keep the network up, people have to do more stuff. Right here. And the question is, how do you know what design will last the test of time? And if I knew that, <laughs> man, I'd be so rich. <laughs> um, one of the things that we do is we very carefully stay away from trends. We look a lot at what the design logic is. Uh, nothing on a DSN interface is ever arbitrary. It's all with a purpose. And so we ask a lot of hard questions. Um, did I do that? Does it look like that because I like it? Or does it look like that because it serves a purpose? Um, right now, most of the design that we're doing is nearly flat. We have no skeuomorphism. Um, we're also not using anything overly animated. We're not using, we're using drag and drop stuff, but we're not doing anything fancy. We figure if it's cutting edge, it may not stand the test of time. But if it's been around for 10 years or more, it may. So it's our best guess, and we have to just really hope that we don't, you know, look back in 20 years and feel very embarrassed, because I gotta tell you, I look at the stuff I did 20 years ago, and let's just say it's not in my portfolio. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how far do we go with the paper prototyping before we start making real stuff? And how long does it take us to get there? So um, I generally will do the sort of, you know, sketch, wireframe, then mock up thing. So you sketch it, you wireframe it in black and white with just plain lines, and then you start mocking things up looking like they might look in the final product. And that's the point where I stop the paper prototyping, because at that point, I can throw it into InVision, or I can build an app, right? And I can let them click through it for real. 
Um, but when it gets to the very first mock-ups, when I've applied the visual language and I think I know the workflow, I will often print it out and do my clippy clippy and have a lot of fun with that because that's the last point where they really feel like they can truly influence it deeply. And if I start showing it to them on screen, in their minds it's a real thing now. But if it's on paper, they can still change it. All right, I have zero minutes. Thank you so much for talking to me and please come find me after.